look like before Mario, before the free speech movement. So this is the, this is the free speech of Berkeley Antebellum. <laughs> <laughs> and it will give you also, hopefully, a sense of what the free speech movement had to confront. Over the last 45 years, protests and demonstrations of uh, the Flagowski and the Golden Bear have become Berkeley traditions. We're a university which thrives on challenging the conventional wisdom. And Berkeley students have insisted on participating in the shaping of history and institutions rather than being passive and complacent objects. But if these are new, now revered traditions, they once led a very precarious existence at UC. For much of this century, as Robert Cohen told us in his first book, When the Left Was Young, was young for much of the century, political freedom was a rare commodity on most college campuses, not only UC. The history of student movements, Robbie Cohen reminds us, is the history of speaker and meeting bans, expulsions, physical assaults, censorship, legislative inquisitions, and of course, the expected reaction, and sometimes expected reaction from students. But according to the vocabulary at least, a demonstration for many years, a demonstration was thought to be, at least on this campus, intended to rally students around their athletic teams. A strike, as at the University of Syracuse, was over being denied a holiday to celebrate an athletic victory. <laughs> at the University of Wisconsin, to protest chaperone requirements for school dances. A riot was a panty raid on a sorority house, or an outburst of school spirit that somehow got out of hand, like the night before the big game. On most campuses, as at UC, attempts of students to agitate political questions, to assemble freely, to practice freedom of speech for the press, were met with suspicion and resistance. Unlimited freedom of speech was perceived as an invitation to trouble, promoting subversive activity rather than liberty. And like most college presidents, Robert Gordon Sproul, as Robbie has told us in his book, viewed undergraduate students paternally as naive, immature, errant teenagers in need of guidance and discipline en route to adulthood in need of protection from manipulation by cynical, radical agitators. Students were not said to be influenced by radical ideas. They were said to be infected by them. <laughs> Sproul vowed to combine what he called liberty with order. That is, liberty had to be restricted when it clashed with the needs of school or society. And he defended the ideal of a moderated liberty. That is, in Sproul's words, the supreme principle of human association in a free society is moderation, moderation in all principles. But moderation in all principles was not deemed to be incompatible with surveillance of students' political activities and associations. The Sproul administration, for example, in the 1930s and in the 1940s, engaged in covert action to gather intelligence on student activities. With the encouragement of a Cal alumnus and also Alameda County District Attorney Earl Warren, Provost Monroe Deutsch, and an overzealous political science professor, 
by the name of David Barrows. Yes, Barrows Hall is named after him. You had been a former president of the university and a commander of the National Guard. To these men, the university had an obligation to maintain surveillance of the student left and to purge radical activists. And they sensed no problem in identifying potential troublemakers by circulating the dossiers. So when I came to this campus as an underclassman in 1948, political ferment among students then was extensive and even diversified in its commitments. But the old mechanisms of repression and surveillance were still very much in place, very much in place, along with overly protective and vigilant administrators. So in our political science and history courses, we studied the United States Constitution. But outside the classroom, we were advised to be cautious and prudent in exercising the freedoms of the Constitution supposedly guarantees. Controversial speakers were excluded from the campus. University rules forbade using the college grounds for partisan political activity. And vigilant administrators <coughs> enforced these rules. So the 1930s and 40s were perilous years for student activism. Now, some of us did not want to be protected or immunized. We were a small band on campus, but we still fought in those years some important battles. We fought the faculty loyalty oath imposed by the Board of Regents. We fought the exclusion of political speakers and activity from the campus. And we did so in the face of close collaboration between campus administrators, some faculty, and police and federal intelligence agencies to monitor students' political thoughts, activities, and associations, to root out subversive, that is liberal or leftist, influences. Only later, only many years later, did we come to realize that fearful landlords or landladies might notify authorities of suspicious political literature in our rooms, or that our phones might actually be tapped, as if authorities had nothing better to do. A graduate student in my department, where is he? There he is, uh, down at the end here, Robbie Cohen, <laughs> <laughs> discovered this letter in his very prodigious research in the university archives which will give you an example of what led to an everyday occurrence. This is a letter from the Dean of the School of Edu Education, W. A. Brownell, to Dr. Robert Gordon Sproul. I'm not going to read the entire letter. Uh, it's a letter concerning my applying for uh, student teaching in order to uh, receive my secondary teaching credential, which everyone had to, to do. Well, they didn't want to get to allow me to do some student teaching. And so they tried to stop it. But they didn't know how to do it. We did not take our action without first trying to find some basis for excluding Mr. Litwack from our program in teacher education. <laughs> Dr. Clinton C. Conrad conferred with uh, Ms. Robb with Captain Wadman, who was the, from the campus police, and with Mr. Conrad, Conard. All agreed, all agreed, that Mr. Litwack should be discouraged, <laughs> but none was able to provide us grounds for doing so that would stand up in court. <laughs> I, thought, I, I thought I had no idea what was going on. As a matter of fact, Mr. Kennard said that in these circumstances we can do nothing other than to allow Mr. Litwack to register in the credential program. Thank you. Uh, what he was uh, referring to here is that this letter is, in, is to report to you and to such other officers of the university as are concerned the recent action of the faculty in education 
with regard to Mr. Leon Litwack. Mr. Litwack is, according to the university police and the FBI, a person with definite leanings <laughs> toward communism. <laughs> Mr. Litwack applied for admission to the course, and hence this correspondence between the dean and, and Mrs. Rao. They decided finally that the only way to, to deal with this was in the future, we might want to require people applying for student teaching to take loyalty oaths. And hopefully that would stem the tide. Well, as I said, these were perilous, sometimes perilous years for student activism, and yet it persisted. Universities did a poor job of protecting the civil liberties of suspected students and faculty. College students made it, college presidents made it clear that academic freedom would not protect the jobs of individuals who belong to the Communist Party or who refuse to cooperate with congressional committees. And the best universities succumbed. The presidents of Yale and Harvard secretly cooperated with the FBI while publicly portraying their institutions as bastions of academic freedom. There will be no witch hunts at Yale, proclaimed as president in 1949, because there will be no witches. <laughs> we do not intend to hire communists. Now UC took that position much earlier. Communists were barred from the faculty in 1940, a regential act which the faculty did not oppose. Nine years later, the Board of Regents, still fearing ideological contamination, demanded of each faculty member a loyalty oath. oath. If anything has been said, a misdirected attack on faculty radicals says internal academic investigations had managed to do, for the most part, its own purging. Fear, intimidation, repression took a toll on student activism. By the early 50s, Berkeley had become quiet and secure with a student body that was cautious, passive, apathetic, and fearful of any ideological contamination. Curious posters circulated a petition on students. The petition only contained the Bill of Rights, nothing more. Most students, overwhelming number of students, refused to sign it. <laughs> Among students, it was difficult to find a rebel or a reformer, let alone a Marxist, and increasingly difficult to find anyone who cared very strongly about anything. If students seemed unaware of race, militarism, sexism, and inequality, if they were complacent and smug, if they were basically uninteresting, so with much of the country. If they gave their elders no clear sense of who they were, it was because they were very much like their elders. What came to be called McCarthyism taught them to keep their mouths shut, to choose their friends and affiliations carefully to avoid controversy. The war in Korea provoked little debate, only a determination to avoid military service. Both administrators and teachers took pride in their products. Young men and women who clearly preferred security and the good life to risk and self-assertion. They expected to conform and to reap the promised rewards, increased earning power, and enhanced social prestige. These men do not question the system, Fortune magazine said gleefully of my class, the class of 51. Their aim is to make it work better to get in there and lubricate the machinery. They're not rebels. They'll be social technicians for a better society. Clark Kerr, the newly inaugurated president of the University of California, said with the utmost confidence of the class of 59, the employers will love this generation. They're not going to press many grievances. They're going to be easy to handle. There aren't going to be any strikes or any riots, excuse me. I left Berkeley in 1958 to teach at the University of Wisconsin. When I returned here six years later, 
the harmonious political, intellectual, and social system characteristic of the past several decades was coming apart. And the legitimacy of our institutions, our dominant values and assumptions were being disputed as ever before. Victory eluded my generation. It was left to others to win the battles we had fought in the 50s. And UC is a far better and freer place because those battles were fought and won. The struggle taught us a lesson. And Robbie Cohen's Freedom's Auditor underscores that point. The university, regions and administrators alike, did not yield power easily or graciously. The victories had to be secured by unrelenting agitation by students and faculty, questioning and challenging the insensitive and faceless bureaucracies that were making the most critical decisions affecting their lives. You know, it's been said of administrators that they sometimes act wisely once they've exhausted all other alternatives. <laughs> We came to learn from these struggles. We came to learn the underlying fragility of the freedoms we enjoy. That we risk the loss of our liberties if we depend on documents or administrators to protect them. That the best way to preserve our rights is to exercise them. We learned too with more difficulty that free speech rests also in the right of others to speak out on behalf of what we believe to be absolutely wrong. When we honor UC, we celebrate the good reason, its academic renown, and achievements, its contributions to science and the humanities. When we honor UC, we honor too Mario Savio and the free speech movement. In making UC, and I've been, caught, I've been in some trouble for making this statement when I made it in my 50th, uh, the 50th anniversary of my class uh, in a convocation at the Greek Theater, I said in making UC a free, open, and pluralistic campus, a true marketplace of ideas, a place that would become synonymous with this nation's most cherished right the right of dissent, Mario Savio and the free speech movement gave as much to UC as any of us distinguished Nobel laureates, financial benefactors, or fabled coaches. <laughs> I was told afterwards that when I said that, portions of my class sitting in the audience sat right on their hands and expressed absolute shock that one of their own would make such a statement. But we remember Mario also, of course, for his imposing presence and voice. His compassion, his sense of justice, the intensity of his intellectual engagement, the depth and the consistency of his commitments. He held steadfast to his belief in social justice, even as so many others, the politically stylish, fell by the wayside of compromise, indifference, and accommodation. Mario Savio exemplified in so many ways the slogan popularized in 1968 by French students in the streets of Paris who shouted, be realistic, demand the impossible. Thank you. <laughs>